the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else can heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Do that third verse as the last one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one, no, not one. No, not the dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. We're glad that you're with us here today. Good, glad to have you on this Sunday morning. Amen. And we're grateful to God's grace to us. We pray that your day is going to go as well as ours. Isn't God good to us? I'm excited about how well he's blessed and how the church is doing. And we're asking God to take care of all of our people, no matter where they are and where they're going. We've been able to have a lot of input with our missionaries. We have a lot of folks on our prayer list, some having surgery, some going through strains in their lifetime and others just waiting to get things done in their life. So you keep those folks in your prayers, especially those of us that are praying for our missionaries. We have a lot of those and a lot of them in enduring the times that we're in. We're going to sing uh, page 275. Uh, if you have your songbook, you can look there. If you don't, you can follow along with us. Most of you probably know this song well enough. You could sing it without a book, I promise you. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into this. Father in heaven, how we care so much for those things that are going on around us. And yet, Lord, we are so frustrated sometimes because they don't seem to make the sense that we want them to do. Lord, we live in a complicated world. And I don't know that it hasn't always been. And I'm grateful that my God is a God simple enough that a child can trust you. And yet, Lord, capable of handling everything that I can. In these times, Lord, help us to learn to turn our cares over to you. That's not easy. Help us as we do that. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless as we sing this great old song about that same thing. When everything seems to go wrong, we still have God. And we're grateful that our security is in the Lord Jesus Christ and not in these things. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It is well with my soul.
that death's last assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Look at the last verse. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be signed, when clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the one thing real quick please let's go right back and let's do that chorus we'll come in on that last line but we're going to do the chorus a cappella. I want you to sing with us I know most of the time you don't sing the songs along with us but I want you to think about all the things that go on in the world but everything's right between us and God when we know Jesus let's sing it together it is well, it is well with, my soul. with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen.
Hello, welcome to the Heritage Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here today with us. We're going to preach a message we believe God laid on our heart about the sufficiency of Christ. We live in a world that never seems satisfied, but I want you to know that God meant for you to be satisfied in Christ, and He wanted you also to know the potential that you have in Christ. And so if you would, would you start reading with me in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13. We're going to start in verse number 5 and read down to verse 16. Verse number five says this, let your conversation be without covetousness. Now you probably know what covetousness is. Remember the, that was one of the 10 commandments, thou shalt not covet. It, that's different than wanting. I mean, thank God all of us want something and we press toward it and we do it. Covetousness is something that you would be willing to do to obtain whatever you want. And that what you're willing to do is to give up God to get it. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's house. So you can't get that without giving up God first. Because he'll tell you no. Thou shalt not covet. Don't give up God for anything. Then he's going to tell you here, let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, which have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And that might be a good thing to think about when you're picking out some pastor or somebody to follow or somebody to believe or listen to when you're preaching or teaching. Then it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried away about with divers and strange doctrines. That's always a good thing. Stick to the book. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with means, for which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. What are you willing to trade God for? What are you willing to trade truth for? What are you willing to trade yourself for? See, you, you, your whole life is going to be a series of decisions just like that. He's trying to get you to think about it what you have in Christ, what potential you have in your life right now, and what potential you have in your life in the future. Then he said, we have an altar where they have no right which, uh, to eat, which serve the tabernacle. We're not going to go back to law and legality and to offering sacrifice. All those things were picture types. We have the reality in Christ. Why would I go back to a picture? And he said, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought, into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us therefore go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And I'm going to tell you what he's talking about. Pretty simple. You're going to have to step out of your worldly mode and get into some kind of uh, Christ-like mode, some spiritual mode, some way that you understand that it's not just the things around you, but there's more to life than what you hold in your hand and what you have in your pocket and what's in your bank account. The first time you ever hold your a newborn baby in your hand and that baby is yours, it's a strange thing how it changes your whole life and all of your values. Think about it. He said, wherefore this? Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And, and, and what I'm telling you, and he's telling you, don't, don't believe that everybody in the whole world is going to be excited because you don't think it's, it's as important for you to have a, a, a promotion as it is for you to be a good father or mother or a good man or woman in Christ at church or at home. It will cost you something. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, are you satisfied being here? Not me. Uh, you say, well, what do you want in the world? I, I, want to, I would like to serve God to my utmost ability. Then when I've done everything I'm supposed to do, to know that I can step over and be in front of him without any regrets. Is that a strange thing? Probably. But he said, we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I know where I'm going. I know whom I have believed. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, 
for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Your conversation, that's what we're talked about up here, is not just what you say. Verse number five, it's what you live. Paul would say, let your conversation be without covetousness. And that's what verse five says. We have the ability to pray for everything, to pray for anything, to expect God to do things that are not normal or natural. I expect him to do miracles in my life. You say, well, do you think he does? I'm pretty sure he does. God is a great God and he's answered more prayers and I expect that he has no limit. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. The sufficiency of Christ. You have all you need. That's what I want you to think about. Christ is sufficient for you. You have all you need to serve God. That's why we read verse five again. Be without covetousness. You say, well, I'm not very smart. You're smart enough to serve God. I'm not very physically talented. You're physically talented enough to serve God. I'm not very tall. I'm not very short. I'm not very good looking. I'm super brilliant. I'm, I don't care what it is God made out of you. He said, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I want you to understand that you don't have to be jealous or you don't have to be covetous. You don't have to desire what other people have. God made you what you are and you can serve God the way you are. Now, you may have to change how you run your mouth. You may have to make, change the way that you, what you have in your heart. You may have to conform your mind to Christ. But I'm telling you, God made you capable of serving here, here in the world. Then in verse, and then we go down. He said, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. What do you mean you expect to be able to change the world one soul at a time? The Lord is my helper. I believe it can be done. Well, what if we took it from you? Can I tell you something he just told you? He said, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You can't take away what God gives me. You can't do it. <clears throat> you can put me in solitary confinement. You could keep me away from everything out there modern, but I can tell you that God is still sufficient. You have all you need to serve God. You have all you need to serve God. Nobody can take it away from you. I just read that to you. Think with me. Moses had a rod. Remember that? God said, what's that in your hand? He said, a rod. He threw it down. <clears throat> and it became a serpent. And God told him to pick it up. And he picked it up. And guess what? That one act of faith showed Moses that that rod could use, could turn the water to blood. It could open the Red Sea. It could be struck in the rock of Lord and bring enough water out to feed thousands and millions of people. It towered over Amalek and war. I want you to understand, just like Moses, you have what you need to serve God. When you look back at Moses' life, my Israel needed a leader. You know what God did? God brought forth the man and he had him trained in all the wisdom of the best wisdom in the world had at the time. And then when he got ready for him, Moses was ready to serve God at the same time. And God used that same man, teaching him a little patience to do exactly what God had called him to do. You have all you need to trust God with what he gave you. What did he give you? He gave Moses a rod. What did he give you? He gave you all kinds of talents. You have all kinds of abilities. I'm amazed at people who have artistic ability. I'm amazed at people that have musical ability and playing instruments and things. Doesn't that amaze you? I would say, Lord, you know what? If you let me do that, then I'm afraid to say anymore because I know me and so does he. But I'm telling you, they have been given great talents. All of us have something that God can use. And God gave you a gift. And the scripture says in the book of Ephesians in chapter four, you can go read it later, that when he made you in the Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit gave you a gift that you should be able to, you say, what is my gift? That's your purpose in life to find out what it is. One talent is enough to give it to God. How many talents do you got to have? Oh, if I had 60 talents, no, I'm telling you. How about the one you got? Mary had done what she could. What did she do? She anointed the Lord's body for his death. Elijah's widow, what did she do? She fed him. With just one little bit of oil and a little bit of meal. The widow with just two mites, what did Jesus say was impressed with her? Because she gave all that she had. The woman at the well, she got Jesus a cup of water. The kid with five loaves and two fishes, guess what? They shared them and God blessed thousands with it. 
That's what I'm telling you. You have all you need to serve God. You got all you need to be happy serving God. I don't believe God meant for us to be miserable serving him. I am not miserable. I love serving Jesus. And if I could stay awake 24 hours of a day doing it, I would do it. Wherever I go, whatever I do, whatever I want. You say, preacher, is there, is there anything you'd rather do than serve Jesus? No, I, I can't think of anything. And I'll tell you now, I like doing almost everything. If you knew me well enough, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. But well, God has never disappointed me. And I've never regretted one time putting my life in his hands. I wonder sometimes how he puts up with me. But I know one thing, I can be happy serving Jesus. If you look in that chapter 4, verse 13 and 14 of the book of Acts, let's take some time just to look at the verse. Can we do that? Acts chapter number 4. And I have this morning one of my kids' Bibles with me. I'm using one of our church Bibles that our kids use. And it's a little bit different. They're really good at finding scripture verses. Chapter number 4, verse 13 and 14, it says, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they had knowledge of them and had knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Whoa. And beholding the man which was healed, they could say nothing against him. Guys, listen to me. You say, well, I, I don't know if I have enough ability. You remember what that Peter was, that fisherman guy, that brassy, bold, loud, Stand out, get himself in trouble, mouth guy. You know, when he got saved, he used that same mouth to be fearless before those that threatened him. When they said, you can't do this here, he, he was careful to say, should we obey you or God? When they didn't think he could do what he did and they weren't smart enough to know what he knew, they said, it must be Jesus. And I'm telling you that you have all you need to be happy serving Jesus. Number one, you have joy unspeakable in 1 Peter. That's what we have in Christ. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Preacher, explain it to me how it feels to be saved. Can't do it. I can tell you all the greatness of it, the wonder of it. I can smile with it, go over it over and over, but you'll never know it till you know it. And every if one of us that know it, when we say it's that joy of the Lord Jesus Christ, we understand doesn't always come with no problems in the world, doesn't always come without tribulations in your life, but I'm telling you, it's there no matter what. It's the joy unspeakable and full of glory. And then the Bible says, we have a peace that passes understanding. Philippians 4, 7 says, the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? How's the world going to turn out? You know what I found out? I don't know. But a songwriter a long time ago said exactly what we were told by Paul when he said that the peace of God, which passes understanding, really in your hearts. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't try to understand. But I do know one thing about tomorrow. I know the one who holds tomorrow, and the one who holds tomorrow holds my hand. That, that's enough, isn't it? No lack of provision. Remember what the, we were told in Philippians? But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I know a lot of people that are trying to get other people's stuff. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they just saw all the treasures that God has for them if they walk with him? A reward in heaven. Think about that. What could be better than going to heaven? A reward in heaven. What would be better than being with Jesus? Jesus giving you that reward. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name. It'd be good to be accused of being a Christian. Are you one of those Jesus followers? We can tell you are. We can tell by the way you talk. We can tell by the way. When's the last time you've been accused of that? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the, the prophets which were before you. You have all you need to make a difference in eternity. You have all you need to make a difference in eternity. Can I tell you? You say, preacher, what are you talking about? You can do what you can. You can, you can do what you can. You go back to the book of Nehemiah and you look back in chapter four and the Bible says they came to him and said, you can't build a wall and we're going to stop this. We're going to do this. We're going to bring men in. We're going to. And the Bible says that. It, so we built the wall. You know how they did it? They did all kinds of things. They worked with a tool in one hand, the weapon with the other. They took turns. They slept at odd times. They didn't get to take a bath as often as they wanted. But the Bible says that they did it. 
You can make a difference in eternity. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says, and having done all, 15, 58, having done all to stand, stand. Take a stand for the Lord. I had a great older preacher friend of mine one time that told me, I asked him, I said, how do you deal with things that come along? He said, uh, I said, how do you know what to stand against and what not to stand against? And he said, well, you know, he said, I just take a stand. And when things come along, they bump into me. There you go. Share what you have. What do you have in the Lord Jesus? Share what you have. You say, well, preacher, all I have is the woman, the widow woman that fed Elijah. And did God increase what she had? How many of you believe that the woman that Jesus said that gave the last pennies, half a penny that she had, starved that night? My God shall supply all your needs. You know what he said? Share what you have. God loves a cheerful giver. You say, I don't have anybody. How about joy? Do you have peace? Do you have joy? Do you have time? Do you have wisdom? Do you have something that you can share with other people? Can you help a kid? Could you teach a Sunday school class? Could you work at the churchyard? Could you do something? See, I'm telling you, we're, we're limiting ourselves. You have all you need to make a difference in eternity. You have all your difference to make in somebody else's life. And when you do that, it's an eternal investment. My Bible says you have all you need to conform your thinking to Christ. You have all you need. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I learned something a long time ago, and my kids helped me learn a few of those things along the way. And I got my girls one time and came in, and they had made a batch of cookies. They were awful. Life is full of all kinds of things. Do you know that? You got a little bit of work, and you got a little bit of play, and you got a little bit of vacation, and you have some of these things, and friends, and you've got family to deal with. And I mean, it's just filled up with all these things. And everyone has their place and everyone has their amount. The Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, should be number one. Love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. And be. You say, what what do I have to do with cookies? Well, you know, everything's pretty good with just a little bit of vanilla in it. You know that? And so we were looking at those cookies that were trying to pour onto a cookie sheet. It's kind of interesting. Vanilla's good, right? They they read the recipe and it said tablespoons. And somehow together that turned out to be cupfuls. We didn't eat those cookies. We laugh about them still today. Because you see, Everything in proportion of your life makes your life better. God in his place, your children in their place, your husband and wife in their place, your church in its place, okay, the word of God in your place. And I'll tell you what's the problem with most Christians. They're filling their life up with with worldly stuff. They're filling their life up with worldly stuff. I challenge you. I'm, I'm, see, I'm challenging. Take a Sabbath day. Well, preacher, I can't quit work. No, no, no. Not quitting work. Don't turn on your television for one whole day. Stay off of Facebook one whole day. Part of you are already breathing heavy, aren't you? Don't answer everybody that sends something to your inbox. Take a sabbatical. Be a peacemaker. But I'm telling you, your life, you have all you need. And your biggest need is to conform the way you think. And you know how you do that? You put more God into it and less world into it. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have all you need to be an example to others. 
Jesus said, "Been always to pray and not faint. You know what I found in my life? It is so much easier to complain than it is to pray. Think how our lives would change if we prayed to God as much as we complained to others. It'd be a different world, wouldn't it? My Bible says to tell us this. Men are always to pray and not faint. You have all you can. You don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't chunk in your life. Don't give up your Christianity. Don't walk away from your family. Don't do any of that stuff. Pray about it. Tell me what God says. Number two, put in mind, Paul said, to be subject to principalities and powers. Now, you know, I don't like every law that is brought out. I really don't. Some of them I'm grateful for, and some of them I'm questioning and all that. But you know what? Nobody asked me. My Bible says that we obey those rules. Unless they're absolutely against the word of God, and we can show you, then put that seatbelt on, wear that mask wherever God has you to go and wherever they tell you you're supposed to wear it. Until he tells you you don't have to, then you obey those in authority over you. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Titus 3 8. I want you to understand that God didn't tell you had to agree with every rule that was made in the world. He just said you should be obedient to the law that is not contrary to his. Then I want you to understand this, that we have a promise to being profitable and good coming into our life when we take it from God. Look at verses in Titus. This is a faithful saying, these things will thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. You can maintain good works. How, oh preacher, what could I do? You know, when I get to the place in my lifetime that I cannot do something for the cause of Christ, I would be glad for him to just take me home. You see, that's, that's radical. Yeah, it is. Isn't it? But I, you know why I say that? As long as God leaves me here, I don't care what condition physically or some other reason, I will be able to do something for God if that's his will in my lifetime. And it is his will in our lifetimes. That we, they which believe in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Can you figure out a way to be a blessing to anybody? I bet you can if you work at it. You already have what you need. You got all you need to be a faithful witness to Christ. You know, one of the worst things that ever happens to us is we learn too much. Oh, we ought to learn to walk with God. We know about heaven. We can speak of eschatology and we understand all the great things. We can just, like, right? When's the last time you just asked somebody if they were saved? Oh, preacher, I, I don't know how to do that. Can you hold a card in your hand? I bet so. Can you talk to somebody and say, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? Well, I don't know what to say, preacher. Get a track, give it to them. Say, well, this, this little piece of paper will teach you that. And you can sow some seed. You said, preacher, you have all you need. You got all you need. Take the word of God. Study the word of God. Read the word of God. And when God gets ready for you to use it, he'll bring it back to your mind. I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now I want you to understand, he's talking now about the Macedonian church, which was willing to give way above their own selves. You know why? Because he said first they gave themselves. They're like Isaiah said, you're my God, send me. But thanks be to God would push the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. See, you know what Titus is? When he looks at you guys, he just does it with joy in his heart. Can, you want to go check on them? You want to go tell them these things? You want to go encourage them? Titus is ready to go because he cares for you. And then Paul would say this in Philippians, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me had flourished. You know what he said? In the beginning, all during my ministry, and during the end, you've been a blessing to me. 
You've been a witness of Christ in you. You've helped share the gospel with the world, known men, and you're still doing it. You have all you need to be a blessing to others. You have all you need. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, I would tell you about the situation between the two cities, but I'll let you look it up. You sent once and again for my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Was it not Jesus who said, as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me? Matthew 25. I thought so. And he said, because of that, my God shall supply all your need. What are you lacking in your life? He said, well, I'm, I, I want money and treasure. And no, I'm talking about really. Listen to me. I got an idea. Half the people I know who are lacking money, if they just work, would be okay. If you learn how to handle the money, it'll be a great better thing. God may never increase your income, but he can teach you if you will let him, how to make what you have go way further than you ever thought. Second sermon there. But my God shall supply all your need. Maybe your real need in lifetime is to figure out how do I, with my life, serve the God of heaven. And I'm, this is what this whole sermon is about. You already have it. You're just not using it. It's all yours. You have all you need to reveal Christ in the world. What should motivate us if we don't see their condition? Jesus said, say not ye there yet four months and then come with harvest. Look unto the fields. Look on, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. For they're white already. The harvest. How many people keep up with every COVID death? Oh, they know the numbers. They got them down. They grab them off to you. Wouldn't it be a shame if your next door neighbor got that disease? It would be. Really. I got a question for you. If they did get it, have you ever spoken to them about Jesus to know whether they're saved or not? You're looking where? You're looking off to another tomorrow. Next year, you already got everything you need to motivate you. Just look at the condition of the world and you can tell the world needs Jesus. How are they going to hear if we don't tell them? You have all, you say, picture, what could I do? Well, you could get you a marked Bible. You can go through and listen to the preacher and mark some of those verses and tell somebody, you know what the preacher told us today in church? Look at this verse right here. You can do that. How shall they hear if we don't tell them? Romans 13 and 14, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know what verse 14 says? How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? I was grown before somebody even told me about Jesus. I always wonder why they didn't. Surely somebody around me knew Jesus. What's more important, do you think? I would think of what a God calls precious might be one of the most important things Souls are precious. David said the salvation of a soul was precious. You couldn't buy it with money and you can't work for it with works and it can't be bargained for. You know what it came? It came at the price of the only begotten son of God. We know where they can find an end. My Bible says that the trying of your faith is precious. Way more than gold that perisheth. First Peter chapter one, verse seven. God believes you're precious and he's provided you with everything you can possibly need to walk in the world. 
Romans chapter number one says, you have what it takes to walk with Jesus in the world. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but it's according to the spirit. You have all you need in the world to earn a reward in heaven. Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is hand. at hand. Therefore is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and righteousness, not to me only, but to all them, all those who love his appearing. Not only that, he said, we can be ready to go. We could be ready. What greater verse could you have than John chapter number 14? Content. I don't know what about tomorrow is. I don't know what about yesterday. I haven't figured all of that out yet. But I will tell you this. I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You've got all you need to be satisfied in the world. Because it's Christ that satisfies. You could be a billionaire. You'll never be happy. You could own all the land of Texas and you won't be happy. You could have everything that your heart desires fleshly and you'll never be satisfied. But I'll tell you who can. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John chapter 14, verse 1. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That's Jesus speaking. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Listen to me, brother, sister. Listen to me, you out there that are thinking about what you're going to do with your soul in your future. Give it to the Lord. Walk with God. Have something to hang on to that the world can't take away. That you don't have to leave behind when you die. And that you can enjoy for all eternity. Jesus said if it weren't true, he had told you. It is true. There's a great world waiting for us. And there's a great Savior already provided for you. Thank God we know him. And thank God we can tell you that I don't know what your need is, but I promise you, the woman at the well thought she needed water. But what she needed was a glimpse of who God really was. Maybe that's what you need. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, giving us the opportunity to share the word of God. We believe that we have an all-sufficient God. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the savior. Lord, is just everything. You're at all, above all things and before all things. And yet, Lord, in your kindness, in your love, we find mercy and peace and grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And above all that I can ever fathom, you are concerned with us. Not, not enough that we should just go to heaven, but we would have joy there because we would have reward for service. Lord, help us to enjoy our life, but help us to know that the joy of life comes through serving through the Lord Jesus in this life. And we ask you, Father, to bless us with all the sours in Christ. Help us to see it, and we rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, amen.